Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we're doing the biology topics. This is homeostasis and excretion. Homeostasis is a process of keeping our internal body conditions relatively constant. That means there are going to be some fluctuations, but some hormones are going to work at returning the conditions towards that constant value, meaning there are not going to be bigger fluctuations. There are going to be only little fluctuations about a specific value. Since this topic is connected to excretion, we're going to be focusing on the kidneys as well as the skin because these play a major role in excretion in our bodies. This involves removing excess water, removing carbon dioxide, removing salts, and so on. The kidneys remove urine, which contains a lot of salts as well as excess water. The skin removes sweat, and uh, this is not part of excretion. Uh, the other part of excretion is through exhalation. This is ejection and this is not part of excretion. This is just removal of waste that did not enter into the circulatory system. So we cannot classify that as normal excretion. When we refer to the internal environment, like I said here, this means the inside of the body, it includes the blood as well as the tissue fluid. So I will focus on the tissue fluid a little bit later. This is a demonstration of water balance in the body. If somebody consumes food and the volume of water from their food is 800 centimeters cubed, when they drink water or any other drinks, if the volume is 1,400, also through respiration, because respiration produces water, there could be 400 centimeters cubed. The total is going to be 2,600 centimeters cubed, but also we lose some water through exhalation. If it's 400 centimeters cubed, that is usually metabolic water. And then through sweat, if it's 600, through urine 1,500 and through feces that, the total loss is going to be 2,600. Total water in could be equivalent to the total water out. Homeostasis ensures that the water levels in the blood do not go beyond what they should be. Otherwise, the cells are going to be bathed in tissue fluid that is more dilute, and that is going to cause the cells to take up more water, causing them to be destroyed. Now, the next part we're going to look at is tissue fluid and homeostasis. Like we said already, it's involved in regulation of internal conditions, and these include our body temperature, the carbon dioxide concentration, the pH of the blood or the tissue fluid, and the concentration of blood glucose, and many more. But the conditions of the tissue fluid determine how well the cells are going to be. Remember, this tissue fluid is a waterly solution containing glucose as well as salts that surrounds the cells. Here we can see this is the tissue fluid in that area. These are the cells and the fluid surrounding them is the tissue fluid, forming a pathway for the transfer of nutrients between the blood vessels to the cells, meaning oxygen leaves the blood vessels through the tissue fluid to the cells, and carbon dioxide leaves the cells through the tissue fluid towards the blood vessels. Tissue fluid leaks from blood vessels or blood capillaries, so the composition is almost the same, except there are no red blood cells, as well as bigger proteins that could not pass through. Like I said already, the composition of the tissue fluid determines how the cells are going to function. Since this bathes the cells, the pH of the tissue fluid has to be contained. The temperature has to be contained and the solid concentration has to be contained because if the tissue fluid has a higher concentration of salts, then water is going to leave the cells by osmosis towards the tissue fluid and the cell's cytoplasm is going to dry, meaning the cells are going to be destroyed. Or if the tissue fluid is dilute, there is going to be more water leaving the tissue fluid towards the cells. The cells are going to take up water excessively and they're going to burst. And that means the cells will be destroyed. So basically the well-being of organs, meaning preventing organ damage by loss of cells, depends on the concentration of ions as well as water within the tissue fluid. Moving on to urine. Here we have a table talking about the composition of urine. Urea is about 23.3 gram per decimeter cubed. We see there is ammonia, there is going to be other nitrogenous wastes, then there is sodium chloride which is going to be second in concentration to urea. We have potassium, phosphate and many more. Most of these are ions that were part of the blood but they are also wastes like urea and ammonia as well as other nitrogenous wastes that have to be removed in order to decrease the toxicity that could occur to the cells. Now urea comes from the deamination of amino acids so these excess proteins and amino acids cannot be stored and they're going to be broken down in the liver, producing ammonia. But ammonia is very toxic, so this ammonia is going to be converted into urea, which is less toxic. And that urea is going to be transported through the blood towards the kidneys where it's going to be filtered in order 
to remove it from the blood. Now, in our bodies, we can store excess carbohydrates. These are going to be converted into glycogen and stored by urea canad. The skin can pass out some salts as well as some water through sweat, but the urea cannot be removed through the skin, so it has to be excreted out through the kidneys. Looking at the urinary system, this involves the kidneys. We have two kidneys. There is the right kidney and the left kidney. And these are connected to blood vessels. These are the renal arteries, the ones that bring the blood into the kidneys. Remember, arteries are blood vessels that bring blood to the organs, and the veins are those that take away from the organs. So the renal veins are the blood vessels that take away filtered blood from the kidneys towards the vena cava. We can see this is the vena cava that takes away blood from the organs to the heart. The kidneys are connected to tubes called the ureter. These deliver the urine from the kidneys towards the bladder. And the bladder is a sac that stores urine until the urge to urinate is felt. The sphincter muscles are going to relax so that the urine can pass out through the urethra to the outside of the body. Now looking at the structure of the kidney, ignore this. So the kidney is composed of the cortex. We can see that outer area and this contains tiny blood vessels that come from the arteries. You can see even here, they're going to be tiny blood vessels. The kidneys contain the nephrons. Nephrons are microscopic filtering units. We'll talk about those later. They are found within the cortex. And there is the medulla, which is the middle piece that houses the pyramids. We can see them here. And then the pelvis, this is a funnel-like structure. We can see this is the pelvis and it connects to the ureter. The ureter takes the urine from the pelvis or from the kidneys towards the bladder like we saw already. Now the structure of the nephron, remember we said these are the tiny filtering units that are found inside the kidneys. So the nephron is composed of the glomerulus, which is the ball of blood vessels. These blood vessels inside are called the glomerulus and they are located within the Bowman's capsule. This is where ultrafiltration takes place. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. It is also made up of the proximal convoluted tubule, sometimes called the first coil tubule. This is where selective reabsorption takes place. And then after that, the filtrate goes through the loop of Henle. This is where the concentration of water as well as the filtrate is going to be altered to ensure more reabsorption of water in this region as well as in the collecting depths. Looking at ultrafiltration, this takes place between the glomerulus and the Bowman's capsule. So if we take this and expand it, we can see these are the cells of the Bowman's capsule. They have a different shape. And in here we have the cells of the blood capillaries. Remember the blood capillaries are those of the glomerulus. So ultrafiltration takes place here and we can see we have the basement membrane between the two. Now because this is ultrafiltration, it means it occurs at high pressure and this high pressure is going to be attained due to the variation in the diameter of the blood vessels. The incoming blood vessel has a wider diameter, we can see here, and the outgoing blood vessel has a smaller diameter, so that creates an increase in pressure within the glomerulus, causing the filtration or pushing of the small substances from the glomerulus through the basement membrane into the Bowman's capsule space. Only smaller soluble substances are gonna go through, so blood cells as well as proteins are not gonna go through because they are large, and uh, this filtration is based on size. So at the end of the filtration, 100% of glucose, the vitamins, the minerals, amino acids, and so on are going to be filtered into the Bowman's capsule space. The next part is selective reabsorption. Selective reabsorption takes place in the fast coil tubule, or sometimes called the proximal convoluted tubule, or PCT. In this region, you remember it's coiled like that. The coiling increases the surface area, However, the inner epithelial layer is also coiled like that, meaning there are so many microvilli to increase the surface area for the absorption of these substances. As we can see, if this is one cell and that is the next, we can see there is a nucleus, but there are many mitochondria, and the purpose of this mitochondria is to provide ATP. ATP is required for active transport. This is because substances are going to be reabsorbed from this region to the other side all the way to the blood vessels, either by diffusion or by active transport. Active transport ensures 100% absorption of glucose so that urine will not contain any glucose. This is because glucose is useful in the body, so it has to be reabsorbed back. During selective reabsorption, other things like ions, like sodium chloride, can be reabsorbed. There is some reabsorption of water. Amino acids are going to be reabsorbed. 
vitamins are going to be taken back. Usually in the exams, they'll ask you adaptations of the proximal convoluted tubule for its function. You should say it's folded, highly folded, and it has microvilli to increase the surface area for the reabsorption. And it has numerous mitochondria to provide ATP, which is required for active transportation of substances like glucose back into the blood vessels. And if you look back at the structure of the kidneys, the blood vessels are wrapping all around the whole nephron in order to take up the substances that have been reabsorbed. Next, we look at ADH hormone and homeostasis. This is involved in regulating the amount of water in the blood. In the brain, we have a region called the hypothalamus, and this detects changes in the blood concentration, meaning the water as well as the end concentration in the blood. If there is less water in the blood, this region is going to send impulses to the pituitary gland to release ADH hormone. This ADH hormone is going to travel through the blood or be transported through the blood towards the kidneys and it's going to bind onto the distal convoluted tubule or sometimes called the second coiled tubule as well as the collecting ducts making them more permeable to water and more water is going to be reabsorbed. When this occurs, the concentration of the urine is going to increase and the volume of the urine is going to decrease. The next organ that takes part in excretion is the skin. We're going to begin by looking at the structure of the skin. We have the epidermis, which is the upper layer. We have the middle layer called the dermis and the lower layer, which contains the subcutaneous fat. We see the adipose tissue where the fat is stored and this fat is useful in insulation to prevent excessive heat loss. We see there are hair follicles or one hair follicle in this case here. This is controlled by a muscle attached to it. We can see the erector pili muscle. When this muscle contracts, the hairs are going to stand. For animals that have more hair, when the hair stands, it traps air between the hairs and this provides a layer of insulation to prevent heat loss. There are nerves. These nerves transport impulses from receptor cells within the skin to the central nervous system and backwards from the central nervous system towards the skin. There are sweat glands and these produce sweat, which is useful in the cooling of the body during hot conditions. The sebaceous gland produce oil and this could be for lubrication as well as providing antiseptic conditions, meaning to destroy some pathogens on the surface of our skin. Going on to homeostasis and the skin, in cold conditions, vasoconstriction is going to occur. This is the narrowing of the diameter of the blood vessels, like we can see this is smaller and this is bigger. And when constriction occurs, less blood reaches the surface of the skin, as we can see here, since more blood goes through the lower part. Less heat is going to be lost from the body. Also, the hair erector muscles are going to contract and the hairs are going to stand. They will trap more insulating air around the skin, minimizing heat loss. And also, the sweat glands are going to produce less sweat so that less heat is lost. When in hot or warm environments, vasodilation is going to occur, meaning we need to lose more heat so the blood vessels become wider so that more blood comes to the surface of the skin. When this occurs, more heat is going to be lost the hair erector muscles are going to relax and the hairs are going to lie flat to prevent trapping insulating air closer to the surface of the skin. And the sweat glands are going to produce more sweat so that more heat is lost from the body in order to return the body conditions to normal. So this brings us to the end of this video on homeostasis and excretion. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.